let's bow our heads for prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we've been able to study these Sabbath school lessons on worship. What a timely series of lesson, lessons for this day and age. We thank you, Father, because you do receive the worship of sinful human beings like us. We thank you that through the merits of Christ, our praise and our worship is sanctified and purified by Jesus and acceptable in your sight. And Father, as we study the proper response to you in worship, we ask that you will remove preconceived ideas, that you will help us to accept the testimony of your holy word, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth as you command and not as we wish. We thank you, Father, for being with us and for hearing our prayer. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. A common concept has arisen within the Christian church in recent years. The idea is that the Old Testament, when it comes to worship, had strict rules, but in New Testament times we are under grace and therefore God is not as particular about the way in which we worship Him or our style of worship. In other words, there's this idea that God has gone through a conversion experience from being a strict disciplinarian when it comes to worship. Now He is a grandfatherly figure where anything goes. The Bible is very clear that God requires us to make a clear distinction between the holy and the common, between the sacred and the secular. This would include our dress, it would include our music, and it would include our worship practices as well. Scripture is very clear about the distinction between the holy and the common. Stories such as the story of Nadab and Abihu, who took common fire and presented it to the Lord in a worship context as holy. The story of Uzzah, whose common hands touched the sacred ark. Ananias and Sapphira, who appropriated themselves of God's sacred money for secular uses. Korah, who aspired to a sacred office for which God had not called him. Jeroboam, who established places of worship where God had not commanded those places of worship to be. All illustrate that God is particular about worship and that God does not accept a blending of the sacred with the common. Yet today... Christians come to church in common everyday clothes. They speak about common subjects on the Sabbath. They use common secular music, albeit with sacred lyrics. They applaud like people do at a baseball game. They snack. They chew gum. In other words, we have lost to a great degree a concept of the holiness of God. In other words, we worship God as we wish and not as God has commanded. Today I would like to address one of those secular practices which has been baptized as holy in recent years, applauding in church. I promised a few months ago that I would preach a sermon on this very subject because when I stood up, and said that our custom at Fresno Central is to say amen or hallelujah and not to clap, somebody sent me a note and said, well, the Bible is full of clapping. How can you forbid clapping? So today I'm keeping my promise of preaching a sermon on applause in church. Would you agree that we need to do what the Bible says? You know, this is a Bible-believing church and a Bible-practicing church. And what I'm preaching this morning might not be politically correct, but you know what? I care more about what God thinks 
than what church members think. Now, don't get me wrong, I respect all of you and I love you. But my standard is what God wants, not what we want. I want to give you a definition of the word applaud from the World Book Dictionary. It says to show approval, especially by clapping the hands, shouting, or stomping the feet. Interesting that it includes not only clapping, that is applause, but it includes also shouting and stomping the feet. Then it continues to be pleased with, to approve, to praise, to commend, to laud, to extol, and to acclaim. Now it's unquestionable that clapping belongs in the theater, in the concert hall, in the sports arena, and at social gatherings. But in recent years, it has penetrated the church. I remember that except for maybe the Pentecostal and Charismatic churches, as I was growing up, there was no clapping in church, whether it was the Seventh-day Adventist church, the Methodist church, the Presbyterian church, the Lutheran church, any of the mainline churches. There simply was no clapping. There was a response which was amen or hallelujah as an expression of joy and acceptance of the worship service. Now what does the Bible have to say about the issue of clapping? The fact is, folks, and you're going to be surprised at what I'm going to say, there is not even one clear Bible example of clapping in the worship service. The practice is never used in the context of the sanctuary or the temple. You're saying, is, can that be true? The clapping is never used in the context of the sanctuary or the temple? Have mercy. Let me give you four contexts in which clapping is used in Scripture. The first context in which clapping is used or applause is used is when a king acceded to the throne or ascended to the throne. Now, this was not a religious gathering. This was a social political gathering to install a king on the throne. For example, when Joash was invested as king. We're told in 2 Kings chapter 11 and verse 12, and he brought out the king's son, that is Joash, put the crown on him, and gave him the testimony. They made him king and anointed him, and they clapped their hands and said, Long live the king. Now this is not in a worship service. This is a political event speaking about the election of a king. Incidentally, it's interesting to notice that the Hebrew word that is translated clapped in this verse appears hundreds of times in the Old Testament. But only in this one instance is the Hebrew word translated clapped. Most of the times it's translated to smite, to kill or to strike. And I believe the reason why it's translated that way is because when you clap, you strike your hands. But this is the only time in the hundreds of times in the Old Testament that this particular Hebrew word is used, which is translated clapped their hands, that is translated clapped. Now a verse that is commonly used to defend clapping within the worship service is Psalm 47 and verse 1. Turn with me to Psalm 47 and verse 1. Here we are told, and by the way, there's no evidence from the context that this is in a religious worship service. This is actually speaking about the coronation of God at the end of time as King of kings and Lord of lords. Notice Psalm 47 and verse 1. It says there, O oh, clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. And if you look at this psalm carefully, it's talking about the final triumph of God over his enemies. And so it doesn't deal with a worship context in the temple or in the sanctuary. Interestingly enough, as we examine the Hebrew word that is translated, clap your hands here, it appears hundreds of times 
in the Old Testament. And only in this verse is it translated to clap. In fact, most of the times that this word is used, it refers to the palm of the hand, or it refers to the flat of the foot, or it refers to something that is hollow. So only in this one instance, in hundreds of references, that, that this word is used in the Old Testament, is this word translated clapped. So the first context in which the, a clapping is used is in the installation of a king, whether it be a king of Israel or whether it would be God at the very end of time. Now there's a second usage of clapping in Scripture, and that is uh, when nature extols God as Savior and Judge. Did you notice I said when nature extols God as Savior and Judge? It's not talking about people. Notice Isaiah 55 and verse 12. Isaiah 55 and verse 12. This verse is probably well known by us. It's not happening in church. It's not happening in the sanctuary or the temple. It says here in Isaiah 55 verse 12, For you shall go out with joy and be led out with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing before you, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. So unless you're a tree, this gives you no justification for clapping, because it's actually metaphorical or allegorical language that speaks about the joy of nature over the greatness of God. Another text where we find this idea of nature praising and extolling God and clapping being involved is Psalm 98 and verse 8. Here it's not the trees that are praising God, here it's the floods that are clapping their hands. Notice Psalm 98 and verse 8. It says here, Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord. For He is coming to judge the earth. With righteousness He shall judge the world and the peoples with equity. So notice here that it's the floods that are clapping. Uh, so unless you're a flood, there's no justification here for clapping. And by the way, this is not taking place in the church or in the sanctuary. It's taking place in the midst of nature, which is praising God. This is allegorical language. The third context in which con uh, uh, clapping is used in Scripture, believe it or not, is to express disgust ang and anger. Let me give you an example of this. You remember when Balak asked Balaam to curse Israel, and Balaam, instead of cursing Israel, praised them and actually blessed them? Notice what we find in Numbers chapter 24 and verse 10. No, Numbers chapter 24 and verse 10. Balak was furious, and he expressed his anger by clapping his hands. He probably went like this. Let's read about it. It says there in Numbers 24 verse 10, then Balak's anger was aroused against Balaam, and he struck his hands together. And Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies, and look, you have bountifully blessed them these three times. In the book of Ezekiel, we have several references of clapping in the case of being angry or being aggravated. Certainly we couldn't uh, use applause in church in this context, could we? Notice Ezekiel chapter 6 and verse 11. This is when God looks at the evil that is being performed in Judah, in Jerusalem. And notice what, what uh, God says in Ezekiel 6 and verse 11. Thus says the Lord God, pound your fists. That's the New King James. The NIV says, strike your hands together. So thus says the Lord God, pound your fists and stomp your feet and say, Alas, for all the evil abominations of the house of Israel, for they shall fall by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. So clapping is used as a sign of anger. Notice also what we find in Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 13. The same idea of clapping being used in the context of anger over something negative that is happening. In fact, here in Ezekiel 22 and verse 13, we find that God claps his hands together in anger and disgust because of the dishonest gain that is taking place and the blood that is being spilled in Jerusalem. 
Ezekiel 22, verse 13. Behold, therefore, I beat my fists. That's the New King James. The NIV says, I strike my hands together at the dishonest profit which you have made and at the bloodshed which has been in your midst. Once again, in Ezekiel 21 and verse 14, we find this negative context of, of clapping the hands together. Ezekiel 21 and verse 14. God is telling Ezekiel, You therefore, son of man, prophesy and strike your hands together. The third, the third time, let the sword do double damage. It is the sword that slays, the sword that slays the great men that enters their private chambers. And once again, in Ezekiel 21 and verse 17, same context, I also will beat my fists together. Once again, the idea in the NIV is clapping the hands together, and I will cause my fury to rest. I, the Lord, have spoken. So clapping is used in a negative context, both by the prophet and by the Lord, because of disgusting things that are happening among God's people. There's a fourth sense in which clapping is used in Scripture. And by the way, I'm exhausting all of the references. I'm not only giving you examples, I'm, ex I'm, I'm doing an exhaustive study of all of the references to clapping in Scripture this morning. So there's nothing more to look at than what we're studying. Now, the fourth sense in which clapping is used is a morbid glee over the misfortunes of others. It's used frequently in this sense. Notice Ezekiel chapter 25 and verse 6. When Israel was taken captive by the Babylonians, we find the Ammonites expressing their morbid glee at what was happening to Israel. It says there in Ezekiel chapter 25 and verse 6, For thus says the Lord God, Because you clapped your hands, speaking about the Ammonites, you clapped your hands, stomped your feet, and rejoiced in your heart with all your disdain for the land of Israel. Indeed, therefore, I will stretch out my hand against you and give you as plunder to the nations. I will cut you off from the peoples and I will cause you to perish from the countries. I will destroy you and you shall know that I am the Lord. So here we have the Ammonites clapping because of what was happening to Israel. Happening to Israel. Now, when the king of Nineveh fell we find the same idea expressed, once again clapping over the fall of the king of Nineveh. Notice what we find in Nahum chapter 3 and verse 19. And Nahum is speaking about the sins and the final destruction of Nineveh. It says there in Nahum 3 and verse 19, Your injury has no healing. Your wound is severe. All who hear news from you will clap their hands over you. For upon whom has not your wickedness passed continually? So notice once again the idea of clapping in a negative context over the fall of the king of Nineveh. Now it's also used to speak about the, when the rich fall, the rich who are greedy and don't share with the needy and the poor. Notice uh, Job 27 and verse 23. Job 27 and verse 23. And I'm reading all of these scriptures so that we can catch a glimpse at what the Bible really has to say about applause and about clapping. Job 27 and verse 23 says, speaking about the rich and greedy who do not help the needy and the poor, men shall clap their hands at him and shall hiss him out of his place. So notice that clapping is associated with what? With hissing in a negative context. Notice also Job 38 and verse 37. This is Elihu, one of the so-called friends of Job, that is speaking about Job. And of course he's wrong about it, but he says this about his friend Job. Job 34 and verse 37. For he adds rebellion to his sin. He claps his hands among us and multiplies his words against God. So he's saying Job is clapping his hands against God in a negative context. In other words, he's, he's angry at God for what's happening to him. One more reference is what we find in Lamentations chapter 2 and verse 15. Lamentations chapter 2 and verse 15, where we find 
uh, the story of the ruin of the city of Jerusalem. It was so terrible that mothers even ate their children, by the way, when the city was under siege by Nebuchadnezzar in the year 586. Uh, Lamentations was written by Jeremiah for the people to sing as a funeral dirge as they were being taken captive to Babylon. Now notice what it says there in Lamentations 2 and verse 15. All who pass by clap their hands at you. (laughs) And then what does it say? They what? They hiss and shake their heads at the daughter of Jerusalem. Is this the city that is called the perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth? That's the Old Testament testimony concerning clapping. To acclaim a king, nature praising the Lord, allegorical language. In the third place, expressing anger. And in the fourth place, expressing disgust. We've exhausted all of the Bible verses that refer to clapping in the Old Testament. But now some people are saying, ah, but let's go to the New Testament. In the New Testament, there are certainly many texts that encourage God's people to clap. Well, it might surprise you that the word clap does not appear even one time in the New Testament. There is no reference to clapping in the New Testament at all. Not a single reference. And you know, I find it interesting that churches today, non-Adventist churches today, they say, you know, we should be spontaneous and we should clap in the worship service. They say they're New Testament Christians, but there's not one reference in the New Testament that encourages clapping in the worship service. And yet, the Bible has multiple texts on keeping the Sabbath and they ignore those. Should we not go by what the Bible says rather than what is acceptable by tradition? So you're saying, okay, clapping is not presented in a positive context, in a religious context, in the temple or in the sanctuary. We've exhausted all of the texts. So what is the proper response to God in worship? What is the biblical response to God in worship? I believe the secret to understanding what the proper response is, is to understand how heaven worships. Would you agree that heavenly worship is transnational? Do you understand what I mean by transnational? I mean it transcends nationalities. Would you agree that heavenly worship is transcultural? That heavenly worship transcends culture? Absolutely. Because there's one worship in heaven, of all beings, no matter what world they come from, no matter what class of angels they belong to, there's one style of worship in heaven. So if we know how heaven responds in worship, we'll know how God wants us to respond to the worship event on earth. You see, when we get to heaven, we're not going to tell the Lord, well, Lord, that's not the way we worship when we were on the earth. You know, we we need to worship the way that we're used to worshiping. You know, that's not our culture. That's not our nationality. You see, God has a standard style of worship in heaven. And the earthly worship should reflect the heavenly worship. Allow me to read you a statement from volume 6 of the Testimonies, page 366, where Ellen White relates heavenly worship to earthly worship. Notice what she says. The church of God below is one with the church of God above. See, it's one church. Believers on the earth and the beings in heaven who have never fallen constitute one church. Every heavenly intelligence is interested in the assemblies of the saints who on earth meet to worship God. In the inner court of heaven, they listen to the testimony of the witnesses for Christ in the outer court on earth. And the praise and thanksgiving from the worshipers below is taken up in the heavenly anthem and praise and rejoicing sound through the heavenly courts because Christ has not died in vain for the fallen sons of Adam. Uh, Then she says, while angels drink from the fountainhead, the saints on earth drink of the pure streams flowing from the throne, the streams that make glad the city of our God. Oh, that we could all realize the nearness of heaven to earth. 
So is there a close relationship between the heavenly church and the earthly church? They really are what? They're one. So if we know how God encouraged his people in the Old Testament to worship, and if we know how the heavenly beings worship, we'll have a better idea of how God wants us to respond in worship. And of course the question is, how does God want us to respond to things that speak to our hearts in worship? Well, the fact is that the Bible tells us that the way to respond is by using two words that sometimes are used by certain individuals in the church. And I wish they were used more. The words are the words amen and hallelujah. Now I'm not saying that off the top of my head. Twelve times in Deuteronomy chapter 27, I'm not going to read them, but I'll tell you what verses. Deuteronomy 27, verse 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, and 26. Twelve times. One for each of the twelve apostles. We're told that when the Levites taught the people, the response of the people was, Amen. So twelve times God underlines that when the word of God is taught, because the Levites were the teachers, the response of the people was what? Amen. Notice 1 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 36. Here David composed a psalm of thanksgiving to the Lord, and he recited it before the people. When he finished reciting his psalm, I want you to notice what the reaction of the people was. Uh, uh, you know, David was a great composer, so when David finished his performance, everybody started clapping, right? Would that have happened these days? Absolutely. Notice what it says in 1 Chronicles 16, 36. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. He ends his, his poem, and then we're told, and all the people said what? Amen. Amen, and praised the Lord. Notice the book of Nehemiah, chapter 5 and verse 13. Nehemiah chapter 5 and verse 13. Once again, the word amen is the proper response when something in the worship service touches your heart and you want to respond to the Lord, you want to express your emotion and your enthusiasm, amen is the word to use. Notice Nehemiah chapter 5 and verse 13. It says, And all the assembly said, Amen, and praise the Lord. Then the people did according to this promise. And of course they promised to be good stewards. So Nehemiah tells them, you need to be good stewards. And at the end they say, Amen. And they promise to, to keep their word. Notice Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 6. At the end of the captivity, when the book of the law is read before Israel, when the book of the law is explained by Nehemiah, what is the reaction of the people? Nehemiah 8 and verse 6. Then all the people answered, Amen. Amen while lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So what was their response? Amen, not only once, but amen twice. And the word amen, of course, means be it, be it so, or it is so. It's an affirmation of what God says. Notice Psalm 106 and verse 48. Psalm 106 and verse 48. The Psalms are full of this. And the Psalms describe the worship in the temple or in the sanctuary. Notice Psalm 106 uh, and verse 48. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. And let all the people clap. <laughs> no. It says, and all, let all the people say what? Amen. And not only amen, but what? Do you know what that expression, when you find that expression, praise the Lord, in the Old Testament, it's the expression, hallelujah. It's translated praise the Lord, but it's really hallelujah. Notice Psalm 41 and verse 13. Psalm 41 and verse 13. Once again, the same idea, this is repeated over and over and over again in the Old Testament. I'm only choosing a sampling of texts. Psalm 41 and verse uh, 13. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. Psalm 72 and verse 19. Psalm 72 and verse 19. It says here, Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only does wondrous things. 
and blessed be His glorious name forever. And let all the earth be filled with His glory. Amen and amen. There it is again. Notice Psalm 106 and verse 48. Psalm 106 and verse 48. It says there, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. And let all the people say what? This is the command. Let all the people say, Amen. And then it says, Praise the Lord. But really in Hebrew it is, Amen. Hallelujah. Are we supposed to respond in the worship service? We are supposed to respond. We're supposed to respond with enthusiasm. But the response is not clapping. The response is by saying, Amen. It is so, or let it be so, or hallelujah, which means what? Which means praise the Lord. You might be saying, well, but what about in the New Testament? You know, we're New Testament Christians. How, how, how do, does the heavenly uh, throng worship the Lord in a heavenly context? By the way, it's transcultural and transnational, right? Now notice what we find in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 14. And listen carefully. This scene is taking place in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. This is taking place in the sanctuary. It's a worship scene. Jesus, in fact, is being installed as the high priest upon his ascension. And I want you to notice what it says there in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 14. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. How did the four living creatures respond to this scene? By saying what? Amen. Amen. Notice Revelation 7 verse 12. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 12. This is speaking about an, an angelic throng in heaven. It says there, All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, What? Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Notice Revelation chapter 19, verse 1, verse 3, verse 4, and verse 6. Here it's describing uh, the worship of God's people when we finally get to heaven after the victory of Christ over his enemies on this earth. I want you to notice how the praise is going to take place in the future. Revelation chapter 19, verse 1 says, actually we'll read verses 1 through 6, uh, but I just mentioned the verses where the key words amen and hallelujah are found. But let's just read the whole passage. Verse 1, after these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude where? In heaven. See, this is transnational. This is transcultural. It's taken in heaven. John is being allowed to enter the heavenly throne room to see how they worship up there. And so it says, After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying what? Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are His judgments, because He has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. And He has avenged on her the blood of His servants shed by her. Again they said what? Hallelujah! Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who sat on the throne saying what? Amen! Alleluia! Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you His servants and those who fear Him, both small and great. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering saying what? Alleluia! For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. What is the heavenly response in worship? Applause? It would have been a golden opportunity for John to include some clapping in there. But there is no clapping in the worship scenes in Scripture. None of the heavenly scenes in Scripture is there any applause. It is always amen, hallelujah. And also in Isaiah chapter 6 verses 1 through 3, the angels say, holy, holy, holy. In fact, let's read that, Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 3. Isaiah is allowed into the chamber of the Most High, in the heavenly sanctuary. And notice how the heavenly angels worship. Isaiah 6, and verses 1 through 3. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, 
I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, this is a sign of reverence, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Give the Lord a hand. No, that's not what it says. They, what did they do? They sang, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. There is no command in Scripture to give the Lord a hand. People say, when I clap, I'm clapping for the Lord. But the Lord has not commanded you to clap for Him. He has commanded you to say amen and hallelujah and to say holy, holy, holy. Now let me say something about verbal and nonverbal praise. Let me ask you, what does clapping really say in, in verbal terms? It doesn't really say anything. It, it's just, yeah, that's, that's, that's the connotation that people get from it. But the act itself is nonverbal, right? Now, does God want us to worship Him in nonverbal language, or does He want us, according to the Scripture, to visit Him to worship Him in verbal language? It's actually in verbal language because words express thoughts and meaning. Clapping is just noise, if you please. Notice a couple of texts, Psalm 98 and verses 1, uh, actually 4 through 6. Psalm 98 verses 4 through 6. It says here, Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth in what? Song. Rejoice and what? Sing praises. Verse 5, Sing to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of a sound with trumpets and the sound of a horn. Shout joyfully before the Lord the King. Is this verbal or nonverbal? It's verbal, because it has to do with singing psalms, according to this text. Do words have meaning? They most certainly have meaning. Notice 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 8 and 9. 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 8 and 9. Notice once again, the importance of verbal communication as we respond to the Lord in worship. It says there, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon His name. Make known His deeds among the peoples. Sing to Him. Sing psalms to Him. Talk of all His wondrous works. Did you see all of the verbal references in this verse? It says give thanks. It says make known His deeds. You'd have to verbalize in order for that to happen. Sing to Him psalms. And then it says also what? Talk of all his wonderful works. In other words, our praise to God should not be nonverbal, but it should be what? It should be verbal, according to Scripture, because it, words express something. Amen means, it is so, Lord, and hallelujah means, praise the Lord for what you are saying. Notice Psalm 47, verses 6 and 7. Once again, the idea of, of verbal communication as we worship God. Psalm 47, verses 6 and 7. It says here, Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. I think he wants us to know that we're supposed to sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing praises in an unknown tongue. Is that what it says? We're supposed to sing praises with what? We're supposed to sing praises with understanding. Is that verbal or is that nonverbal? That's verbal. God wants our praise to say something. By the way, when the redeemed get to heaven, you know, you can imagine us coming into the new Jerusalem and God the Father is there waiting for us. And what is God doing? <laughs> yeah! No. We're told in Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 17 that the Lord will welcome us with singing. He will welcome us with singing. Because singing is a witness. Do you know there are very few references in the New Testament to singing even. But one of them is interesting. Acts 16 and verse 25. Paul and Silas are in prison. 
And what are they doing at midnight? <laughs> They're singing hymns and praising the Lord. By the way, was that a witnessing event? Amen. Were people converted as a result of their words? Was it worthwhile expressing verbal communication? You see, verbal communication says something, and not only says something, but it witnesses to the greatness of God, and people can actually understand it. By the way, when Jesus was born, you remember the angel said, Yes! Is that what happened? What did the angels do? They sang intelligible words. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth goodwill towards men. Peace, goodwill towards men. Always in heavenly worship you have verbal praise to God. Amen, hallelujah, holy, 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 because words say something. Clapping is simply noise. Even though people assume that clapping means approbation, and of course it does. Now some people say, Pastor Bohr, but the Bible doesn't forbid it, so it must be all right. In fact, yesterday when I was sharing a little bit of this with Eileen, who was up at ASI, she says, but you know what people are going to say. They're going to say that the Bible doesn't forbid clapping. And that's true, the Bible does not forbid clapping. I must give you that. But there are all kinds of things that the Bible does not forbid. Does that mean that they're acceptable? Absolutely not. You know, Ellen White has an interesting statement about the Roman Catholic Church. It's in Great Controversy, page 289. Once you start down this slippery slope of saying, well, the Bible doesn't forbid it, it must be okay, you are on dangerous ground. Ellen White says, Rome began by enjoining what God had not forbidden. Rome began by enjoining what God had not forbidden. Does God forbid celibacy in the Bible? Does God forbid the observance of Sunday in the Bible? No. Does the Bible forbid smoking? So because the Bible doesn't forbid smoking, it doesn't say you can't go to church on Sunday. It says go to church on Sabbath. It says you can't go on Sunday. You can do it. Right? Once you start down that slippery slope, you'll end up where? In the abyss. She says, Rome began by enjoining what God had not forbidden and ended by forbidding what he had explicitly enjoined. And you know these days, you know the Roman Catholic Church celebrates Lent, Christmas, Easter sunrise services, baptize infants, they baptize by sprinkling, they practice celibacy, and their argument is the Bible nowhere says that we can't do this. I think we need to stick to what the Bible says we should do in worship. And not just assume that anything goes because the Bible doesn't forbid it. You know, I could bring to the fore the issue of women's ordination, which is a hot topic in the Adventist church. You know, one of the strong arguments, so-called strong, strong arguments in favor of women's ordination is the Bible doesn't forbid it. Are you with me? The Bible doesn't forbid it. So it's okay. But what does the Bible say about ordaining women. It's silent. But as you examine the testimony of Scripture, it says that all of the priests were male, all of the apostles that Jesus chose were male, and all of the lists that the Apostle Paul gave as far as the church leaders, the elders, the deacons, and the bishops says that they need to be husbands of one wife. So, but it doesn't say that you can't have it the other way around. Once we start on that slippery slope, anything would go in the worship service. Where does the Bible say that you can't laugh in the spirit? Do you know if there's churches where the minister comes up to people and looks at them and they start laughing uncontrollably? Like they're intoxicated, there are people that walk up and down the aisles, you know, like they're drunk. There are people that roll in the aisles. Well, the Bible doesn't say you can't do that. See, once you start with something like clapping, it can lead to other steps. And so we need to stick 
to what Scripture has to say. Ellen White had a very interesting statement about popular revivals these days. Great Controversy, page 463. She said, popular revivals are too often carried by appeals to the imagination, by exciting the emotions, by gratifying love for what is new and startling. Converts, listen carefully, converts thus gained have little desire to listen to Bible truth. Little interest in the testimony of prophets and apostles. Unless a religious service has something of a sensational character, it has no attractions for them. A message, listen to this, which appeals to the unimpassioned reason awakens no response. The plain warnings of God's word relating directly to their eternal interests are unheeded. You know, if our ministers had sat down and they started studying the scriptures and they said, wow, you know, the Bible says we're supposed to clap and we're not clapping. You know, we better start clapping in the worship service. If that had been a result of Bible study, I would be more prone to accept it. But that's not what's happened. You know, where our theologians and our ministers sat down, they studied it out in the Bible, and then they say, well, you know, we haven't cl been clapping, we really need to clap. The practice has simply infiltrated into the Adventist church from popular culture, not from a study of Scripture. Now somebody might say, well, but wait a minute, Pastor Boer, what about Ellen White? Well, let me share some things about my research in the writings of Ellen White. She uses the word applause 213 times. That doesn't include applauded, you know, other forms. The word applause, 213 times. Now listen carefully. You can check me out on this. Never does she use the word in the context of earthly or heavenly worship. And secondly, in every reference she presents, it is in a negative context as something to be shunned because the ten of the tendency to cause pride and vainglory in the hearts of those who are applauded. Allow me to read you some statements from the writings of Ellen White. This statement, of course, is found in uh, Historical Sketches 2.11, uh, and she's referring to a meeting that took place where there was applause. She says, from the secretary's opening remarks, it was evidence that the, evident that the people expected a regular campaign address full of statistics and stories about the crusade. And when they saw that the subject was to be argued from a biblical standpoint, they were at first astonished, then interested, and finally deeply moved. So when the Bible was preached, what happened? People were astonished, then interested, and finally deeply moved. And then she says this. See, they'd come with the intention of clapping and having a good time, like at, at a regular address. And she says, there was no smiling, no noisy applause. All seemed to feel that the subject presented was too solemn to excite merriment. Interesting. Here's another statement in the book, Christian Leadership, page 73. She says, unless the minister shall fearlessly declare the whole truth, unless he shall have an eye single to the glory of God, and shall work under the direction of the great captain of his salvation, unless he shall move to the front, irrespective of censure, and uncontaminated by applause, he will be accounted an unfaithful watchman. Notice she says, uncontaminated by what? By applause. You see, when a minister says something that, that uh, you know, excites the congregation and, uh, and maybe seems funny, you know, and people start laughing and people start clapping, the minister says, hey, you know, I'm a pretty good comedian. I'm a pretty good preacher. And starts feeling self-sufficient. Ellen White also says in Councils on Health, page 384, both thought and action will be necessary if you would attain to perfection of character. While brought into contact with the world, you should be on your guard. Notice what she says. You should be on your guard that you do not seek too ardently ardently for the applause of men and live 
for their opinion. Desire of Ages, page 261. She says, in marked contrast to all this was the life of Jesus. She's talk, contrasting the Pharisees with Jesus. In that life, no noisy disputation, no ostentatious worship, no act to gain applause was ever witnessed. Evangelism, page 181, God calls upon the ministers of the gospel not to seek to stretch themselves beyond their measure by bringing forward artificial embellishments. Now what does he mean by artificial embellishments? Striving for the praise and applause of men. Being ambitious for a vain show of intellect and eloquence. Volume 3 of the Testimonies, page 185, I'm only choosing a sampling of what she says. There's 213 of them, most of them expressing the tremendous dangers of applause. She says, some ministers, and she's speaking to me here, some ministers of ability who are now preaching present truth love approbation. Applause stimulates them as the glass of wine does the inebriate. Place these ministers where they have a small congregation which promises no special excitement, and which provokes no decided opposition, and they will lose their interest and zeal and appear as languid as the work, uh, in the work as the inebriate when he is deprived of his dram. These men will fail to make real practical laborers until they learn to labor without the excitement of applause. The book This Day with God, page 86, she says, The world's honor, the world's glory, and the world's applause are not worth anything to us. Review and Herald, June 28, 1897, she says, The esteem and applause of men are of great value to some minds, for they labor for this much more intensely than they do to examine themselves whether they be in the love of God. Satan is constantly seeking to crowd vain glory into their hearts that he may steal away their humility and meekness, love and patience. Let me just read one more. Review and Herald, December 4, 1894. She says, The applause of men is the food that is relished by the perverted appetite of the Christless soul. Ouch! Once again, the applause of men is the food that is relished by the perverted appetite of the Christian soul. Junk food, I would add. She says, infatuated by satanic ambition to have the supremacy, professed followers of Christ are led on from one delusion to another until eternity is lost out of the reckoning. But he who lives godly in Christ Jesus will have no relish for the forbidden praise of men. So then this is the big question. How did applause and clapping come into the church? I want to read a statement that was written by Angel Manuel Rodriguez, who was for many years uh, the director of Biblical Research Institute of the General Conference, a man I highly respect, a close friend, and uh, whenever I have any theological issues or questions, I call him, because he's a tremendous Bible scholar. After he studied the issue of clapping, this is the conclusion that he reached. There is no clear evidence that this gesture was part of the worship service in the Old and New Testaments. In fact, I did not find the phrase in the New Testament. Neither did I when I did my research. Therefore, there does not seem to be any biblical parallel to what is taking place in our churches today. You may ask me, why do we do it? I am not sure there is an answer, but then he gives an answer. <laughs> I suspect that we incorporated clapping into our services from our cultural environment. Clapping is usually associated with the entertainment industry, but has become very popular in evangelical televised religious services. Perhaps we copied it from them. I believe that we did copy it from them. I'd like to end by giving you an illustration that I think will, will show that when we worship God, we need to do it in a sacred manner. We cannot use a secular response in a sacred environment or a sacred response in a secular environment. 
they must remain separate. Amen and hallelujah and holy, holy, holy belongs in a sacred environment. Clapping belongs in a secular environment. Some of you might not like this illustration because it appears to be too secular, but I think it's a good one. I want you to imagine that it's the seventh game of the World Series. The San Francisco Giants are behind in game seven, three to nothing. I figured that most of you would be San Francisco Giant fans. That is, if you're into baseball. It's the bottom of the ninth. And there are two outs with nobody on. And the batter has two strikes and no balls. You catching the picture? The stadium is beginning to empty. The people want to beat the traffic home. The next batter, or that batter that is batting with a two-strike count, gets hit by a pitch. Now San Francisco has a man on first base. Then the next batter hits a single. And the next batter gets a walk. And the people who are driving home and they're listening to the radio say, Bummer, why did we, you know, why did we leave the stadium? This is getting good. And lo and behold, the next batter is Buster Posey. <laughs> With the bases loaded. And two outs. Quickly, the pitcher throws two fastballs 100 miles an hour. And the count is two strikes and no balls. People are saying, oh, we lost. But then the pitcher throws a fastball at 101 miles an hour, and Buster Posey sees the pitch coming, and he swings, and the bat hits the ball square. And the ball flies through the air. It's deep, it's going, it's going, it's going, it's gone. It's out of the stadium. And San Francisco wins the World Series 4-3, to three, and all the people in the stand say, Amen, Hallelujah. <laughs> Is that what happens? What do they do? They clap and they stomp their feet and they scream and holler. You see, they don't use a sacred response to a secular event. So why should we use a secular response to a sacred event? Folks, I believe that we're in a time in history when we need to worship God the way the Bible says we're supposed to worship God. I believe that clapping has no room in the worship service not because of the caprice of Pastor Bohr, fuddy-duddy Bohr, but simply because Scripture instructs us about the way that heaven worships and the way that God would have us worship as well. Is that the way we want to worship? Amen. Praise the Lord. I thank the Lord that at Fresno Central Church we respond the way God has told us to respond. Not being critical of those who do differently, but we need to pray that they'll study Scripture and abide by what the Scriptures teach. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you because your word makes it very, very clear how heaven worships, how they respond to your love and to your greatness. We know, Father, that you want earthly worship to reflect heavenly worship. I just ask, Lord, that you will take away uh, the desires of our hearts to do things our way and that we will be willing to do things your way that we will obey your commands and worship as you say we're supposed to worship in your holy word. We thank you, Father, for having been with us. We ask, Lord, that as we study these Sabbath school lessons on worship, that you will bring your church back to the place where you want your church to be, to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.